Welcome to the Investor Download, the podcast about the themes driving markets and the economy now and in the future. I'm your host, David Brett. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all well. Back in March, I spoke to fund manager Gene Roach and research analyst James Goodman, part of the FTSE 250 team, about the phenomenon of the 30 bagger. Companies which have returned at least 2,900% or 30 times their investment over 30 years. It's episode 202 if you want to go back and listen, but we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Well, we wanted to do a deeper dive into what it is that makes these companies so successful with investors. So over the coming months, we're going to be hearing from some of the people involved in managing those 30 baggers at the very highest level. We want to find out the secret ingredients to their success. Today, we start with Adam Couch, the CEO of food producer Cranswick. You may not have heard of the name, but you will certainly have consumed some of their products, particularly if you're a fan of sausages. We cover everything from the company's long history to what Adam thinks makes Cranswick such a triumph. This podcast is hosted by Gene and James, and you'll hear from Gene first. We very much hope you enjoy Now, recently, we've been doing a lot of work to try and understand the super performance of the UK's mid-250 index. Have you got the stats there, James? Absolutely, Gene. Well, the thing that surprised me most was that the FTSE 250 has actually narrowly outperformed the S&P 500, even in US dollar terms, in the 25 years to the end of February. Yeah, and we got to thinking about what might have driven this. And as part of this, we've uncovered a class of stocks which have contributed to these cracking returns over the period. Yeah, and we spoke about this on our last podcast, which was in March, and it was called Hunting for 30 Baggers, How the UK Beat the US. Yeah, so that's what brings us here today. Um, We have managed to persuade the CEO of one of these companies, Adam Couch. Welcome, Adam. Thank you to come and sit on the podcast sofa with us. Adam is, of course, the CEO of Cranswick. So, Adam, we've known each other for about 10 years now. We have indeed. Yeah. Um, And I remember I used to see Cranswick as an income stock. Um, But since 2013, the shares have actually tripled, which suggests that there's a lot more going on. And just to underline the wonderful returns Cranswick shareholders have enjoyed, £10,000 invested in Cranswick at the start of 1991 is worth over £2.3 million today with dividends reinvested. The shares are up over 230 times. But we're not just interested in the financial returns, are we, Gene? Of course not. Um, we're very keen to hear more about the person and the management philosophy behind this great success story. So, Adam, can you describe the business to us? What are you making up there in Hull that's generating these massive returns? Is it semiconductors? No, we're, we're, we loosely call ourselves a very premium food producer. We've got a very uh, strong track record of building businesses, particularly in the farming sector, have, offering a farm to fork solution, uh, particularly in pigs as well as in poultry. Uh, but we also have offerings in other Mediterranean style products as well, and more recently into the uh, pet food sector. Great. And can you tell us a bit more about the history of the company? I mean, it's uh, it's been around quite a long time, hasn't it? And it, it has really changed over it, the years. It has indeed, mm. yeah. The, the name the name Cranswick uh, derives from a village in East Yorkshire called Hutton Cranswick. Um, and it very much has its roots in farming, uh, farming tradition. In fact, it was actually started by pig producers looking to amalgamate their pig feed. Uh, and then it's grown from that, that, uh, that small base back in the 70s all the way through to uh, the business that we see today uh, with a turnover of 2.5. Three billion. We employ 14,000 staff across 21 sites and across about 350 farms as well. So we have a, an enviable reputation for quality and for bringing people through the business as well to continue that growth story. So we've got a, a rich heritage in East Yorkshire, but many operations up and down the country. And have there been any key people that have really driven the business in your time there? Yeah, m- most definitely. The, uh, the the previous chairman, Martin Davey, uh, was very key to that growth, along with Bernard Hogarth. Uh, and they brought a number of us through the through the business as well. Myself, I've been in, in, in the business now over 32 years. Our commercial director is long steeped in, in the business coming up to 30 years. Our operations officers and our, our CFO are all long-term service. So we've got a, a, a good track record of bringing people and keeping people within the business and continuing that that very stable that stable growth but stable people within that 
And as you said, you haven't always been CEO. So when you joined the business, I think in 1991, what did it look like? What roles have you done before being CEO? Yeah, I, I started as a graduate in the business back in uh, back in 91, as you say, James. It's um, um, it's been a huge transformation over the years. One thing we've we've always run the business in an autonomous format. We give the directors of the business and the senior leaders within the business huge opportunities for growth of their their particular areas uh, and a very light touch approach in terms uh, in terms of interference, if you like, from uh, from day to day operations. We really do empower uh, the people within the business, and that's very very key to the success. Give give people the room to grow and the uh, the, the room to to breathe as such, and you, you'll fi- you'll find they'll very much come to the fore. So a very long-term serving uh, management team. I started in 91 when there was about 250 people within the uh, within the business. As I said earlier on now, we're at, uh, we're at 14,000. Uh, so I started in the pig processing business straight out of university. I did a degree in accountancy, uh, came into the business virtually straight out of university uh, and did most facets within the port processing site uh, from the abattoir all the way through to butchery packing and, uh, and, and the wider business. Uh, as well, we then grew the, the base of that business uh, into offering premium sausage, bacon, looking to a- add value at every a single opportunity. I mean, one, one of the key one of the key features of our business is that we've acquired businesses en route that we kept that existing management in as well. We have food heroes that produce what we believe to be the best sausages, to be the best bacon, and those same the, those same business entrepreneurs are still with us to this day. So staying very much true true to the traditional method, our bacon is air dried for instance it's uh, our sausage was was developed by a gentleman called martin heap who who had a business at the bottom of smithfield market called simply sausages and it was really really important that we remain true to that authenticity that that quality that 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 deliverability of a very good eating quality product and building on uh factories and putting the sheer investment around to continue to create those great products but at scale uh, more recently, we we, acqu- we acquired a, a, a pastry business that we built a large scale pastry site uh, a, around the lady a lady called Jill Ridgard, who produced what we believe to be the best sausage rolls uh, in the country, and we we then build a factory based upon that expertise, add scale to it, but remain true to the artisanal me- methods that uh, that she developed over the years. So we'd like to know a bit more about your typical day, Adam. Yeah, um, typically I'd be I'd be up at about half past five. Um, I like to get around many of the operations as I'm operationally uh, focused uh, for for my, for most of my time. Um, I look at the numbers. We uh, I would tend to see most of the staff as I, I either get to a particular site, see the senior leadership team, have a look around the operation. Lunchtime, we have a lunchtime call every every lunchtime. It started off at the start of the pandemic, but it gives us a good flavour of issues that we have at every one of the divisions. Gives the chance for all the uh, senior leadership team to speak to each other as well on the pinch points that we have around the business. That will take about half an hour, but we'll see service levels, so I'll understand where the service levels are, are at. Have a have a chat with Mark throughout the course of the day as well. Talk some of the financials over. Tend to leave if I can leave, but be about five o'clock. It's uh, ideal because it's been uh, uh, I may be out two to three nights a week seeing customers as well. Join Jim uh, for for some customer meetings, maybe a couple of nights a week, uh, and then I'll be staying out maybe at one of the operations in any event uh, from that point. And you've been in the company over 30 years. A number of other people have been there a long time. What keeps people at Cranswick? Um, that empowerment, that, that empowerment, James. I think that's absolutely key that you allow people uh, to express themselves and, and bring themselves forward. We don't lose good people. We, we, we have a, a really enviable record uh, of, of keeping people. Clearly, you need to reward them well, but more importantly, give them the, the space to breathe and the sp- space to express. And that's been allowed. We've got some of the, the Best well-invested facilities um, in 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 the, certainly in, in the country, if not if not in Europe. We're spending best part of one hundred million pounds a year on that infrastructure, um, and if you can put that resource behind key individuals and remain very true to it, then you can certainly start delivering uh, not just for that individual themselves, but for, but for the wider business as we've seen. And speaking about the development of individuals, can you cast yourself back to when you first started to realise? Um, I'm going to be the CEO of this business. 
Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I, I joined the board, I think it was back in 2003, um, and ha- had a huge scope, both Martin and Bernard, who, uh, who were v- very influential for me as I, uh, as I came in, in and through the business, gave me a huge amount of o- autonomy. Uh, and I became uh, COO and then eventually CEO back in 2012. And again, had, had great advice, got great uh, mentor uh, in both Martin and Bernard. So it was, it was, it was from that point of view, it was it was pretty well 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 uh, well versed if you like in, in how I should uh, how I should think of, uh, I should develop the business. I think people will want to know though why you think well, what's been that secret sauce? Why has Cranswick had that edge? Really, if you had to boil it down, it's one major major key ingredient. That's the people. Mm-hmm. It, it is the people. We are very much uh, a people business. And if I look at some of our uh, competitor set, I would see n- not necessarily the longevity of people there. Therefore, it's not just about the knowledge that you gain over over three decade experience, as I would have, or Jim, or Chris, or or, or even Mark as such. But it, it's 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 conveying that message to people. You do know the, the sector. You know the market and. And I think it's, it's important to know we've, we've, we've come across so many crises over the last uh, 30 years. We've had BSC, we've had foot and mouth, we've had uh, African swine fever, we've had a pandemic and Brexit. And throughout all of that, we've still got an enviable track record of dealing with that, of getting the uh, inflation where it's w- required or conveying a message when we have one to play. And, you know, and to have 33 years of unbroken dividend growth uh, is something we're, we're hugely proud of as well. But it's, it's important for us that our customers trust us. They know what, what, that we can deliver. And that's not, that's not uh, from an investment thesis, of course. That's from a product delivery day in, day out, seven days a week delivery for what is really 364 days a year. You know, we're only missing really Christmas Day nowadays in, in delivering to customers. So that's really important. And that innovation as well, bringing innovation, key innovative themes to the market as well, is also very, very key to that. On Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, you're listening to the Investor Download. Well, actually, we've spoken about the highs. Maybe we could hear about some of the lows. What was sort of stood out from that perspective to begin with? Uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose as some of the the key areas, uh, animal diseases often is often a, a key feature. We, you know, we're 100 percent self sufficient in in poultry, uh, and we're 50 percent self sufficient now in the pigs that that we produce. But it's keeping a watchful eye uh, on those on those prevalent diseases. Avian influenza in more recent times is something that has been uh, been a challenge for us. But we manage it again. It's down to the people again. They're having a really good team on that biosecurity and understanding how biosecurity is so vitally important to a business such as ours as well. So they can be challenges as, as much as anything else, but I think the way we deliver and overcome those is also a key feature of ours as well. Um, maybe you could touch on the philosophy of the business when you encounter you know, a case of disease which is common within the industry. How do you go about dealing with that? Yeah, I, I mean, having uh, we'd have we'd have agricultural directors both for the pig side as well as the poultry side. They'll be very, very close. To it. Again, huge amount of knowledge, huge amount of knowledge within the sector. The the way they uh, operate the biosecurity. Now we will tend to shower in and shower out of facilities. That wouldn't have been commonplace if you'd have uh, even gone back even ten years ago. That wouldn't have been commonplace, and it is becoming extra. Extremely common now. Animal welfare is clearly a key key feature in there as as well. So you've got to be give huge regard for that. But having that knowledge, having that skill set, and that ability of the people that were uh, uh, that, that that having to make these decisions on the ground and and giving them your fully support as well when they want to action something. And the better uh, the better half, the highs. What stands out for you there? Um, Move into poultry. Um, what is it now? Six, seven years ago, I'll move into poultry. Uh, a, a, a real plus point. We 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 invest heavily. We invested ninety million pounds in a facility uh, back in two thousand and nineteen, and and it took best part of two years to build the actual site itself. Um, yeah, that, that was a real, again, it's a people thing, having the right people, not just build a site. And typically when we are building these 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 operations, these huge uh, facilities and infrastructure, it's two years to build them. And it's then two years before you really feel your way through. So it's a long-term project, but having the people there from beginning to end and delivering on that, that, that was a really, uh, a real key high uh, for me. And we like the poultry sector now. We were very much uh, considered pigs and, uh, and, and pig meat and adding value to pig meat products to move into poultry and do exactly the same and building numbers of facilities we built what four facilities in the last two years so we, we like investing we like investing in the in the infrastructure and we think we can make a difference by premiumizing products that are already there focusing on key areas that we think we can genuinely add value to
And just on the poultry industry, that hasn't attracted lots of investment. I think there's a good statistic on I being the first site in quite a while. Yeah, I was the first processing facility to be built in 30 years. Uh, and we, we, you know, we, we like that sector, as I say. I mean, we, we from from a zero start in five years, it's that's about a twenty percent of revenues now. So that's a, a huge feature uh, for us, and, and we, we like that sector. And we continue to invest in the in the main business as well, of course, in the in, in the pig side as well. If you going back three four years ago, we were we we had no farming operation of any note. Today we're fifty percent self sufficient, which is again testimony not just to the guys that are driving that business forward, but to the uh, to the confidence that we have in both of those sectors. We shouldn't forget as well either, both in the pig meat and the poultry sector, they're very good value protein sectors as well, and that is a really key feature. They're both versatile and of good value as well. We were talking just before we we went on air about if you'd inflation adjusted poultry. What what was that statistic? Yeah, like? yeah, we we were working some statistics earlier on, um, James. We uh, I think. Uh, a chicken back in 1969 was 41 pence. If you tied that to inflation, you'd be well into eight pound fifty, maybe close to nine pounds. Now, with inf if inflation adjusted, and, and poultry today is still, you can still buy a whole chicken for five pounds. So it is a very it shows the the kind of value and uh, and the proposition that's been put forward, if you like, from a an economic basis of just where 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 poultry fits. And I, I think um, we should probably thank you at this point for the McCrispy burger. Yeah. Um, that might have been a high for you, potentially developing that product. Were you it, personally it, involved in that? It, it was indeed. I, I, you can you can probably thank Jim more than, more, mm -hmm. more than I can and a, a gentleman called Carl Mead who runs that, that particular operation as well are, are, are very key to that that development and those relationships that we, we built as well. We built a super facility up in Hull that does breaded, breaded products. So we can offer an entire complement now of fresh chicken all the way through to breaded uh, and cooked as well. And that's, that comes out of that site in uh, in East Yorkshire. And that's a, it's only been open 12 months uh, and we've got a lot of exciting products coming through that facility now. And uh, not just at food service, and you touched on the McCrispy, but at the retail front, uh, front shelf as well. Look forward to trying some of them. Now, onto the serious business of capital allocation. Um, and we should probably have a bit of a shout out to your CFO, Mark Bottomley, right here, because um, he's the man in charge of the checkbook there. Um, but James and I have noticed through studying, uh, looking for be the best businesses, um, that the ones which A, generate significant amounts of free cash and then B, reinvest it well, are the ones that, that do the best. Um, and I don't want to make you blush, but we did calculate some numbers before you got here. James, have you got them? Yeah, hand? I do. And mm. We mentioned the poultry investment, four new facilities in the last couple of years. But since you've been CEO, we've calculated that you've spent over £670 million on CapEx, all while delivering attractive returns on capital, paying a steadily rising dividend and operating with minimal debt. So, Adam, um, how do you decide where to invest? Um, we're fortunate that uh, cash constraint hasn't been a feature of, of, of the business. We've generated cash. We do generate cash, as you've uh, as, as you've as you've rightly pulled out there. Um, we will always look for areas where we can add value. Those are the key metrics for us. Where can we actually make a difference? I touched upon uh, pastry early, earlier on. The meze offering is another key area, that, that center plate on dips and hummus, and those are, uh, are very key key areas. And we bought a business last year called Ramona's, who uh, uh, has uh, Ramona's Kitchen, has uh, the best the best hummus product that we, uh, we'd actually taste in the marketplace. Ramona c comes with a business. We now build a site based upon uh, that type of product. So again, We'll only do something where we know we can actually make a difference for it, where there are attractive returns as well and where we can make a difference. Pastry I touched on, as I said before, but hummus is another key, key area. So always look for efficiencies, always put a lot of investment around automation where you possibly can as well to make yourself best in class as well as the most efficient operator within that space. But that not being constrained by cash is a very key area. So we will bat the guys then when they come forward with their uh, with their proposition. And as I touched on before, 100 million pounds a year request makes uh, makes Mark wins from time to time, but he's uh, he's exceptionally good at keeping the purse strings uh, tight where he needs to be. But you know, we've uh, we've managed to attract, to your point, James, mid 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 teens, 15% uh, return on capital employed. So that's uh, that's something that we're quite proud of as well, and we've done that consistently despite the headwinds that we faced with the numbers of uh, difficulties that we faced over the years. 
And you've already started manufacturing our pigs and blankets for Christmas, I think, but in a more efficient way. I thought that was quite interesting. Yes, yeah, absolutely. We've invested uh, quite heavily in automation on pigs and blankets. Now, we'll produce best part of 60 million pigs and blankets and work normally starts on that product from February onwards now. So, so, so critical is that work. So yes, investing in automation is very much a key feature uh, of ours, as uh, I think you guys have seen some f through some of our operational uh, site visits before now. So yeah, again, we will always continue to invest ahead of the curve. And so as you sit here today, imagining the next 11 years as CEO, hopefully, um, what are you excited about? Yeah, a no, no, number of areas. As, as I say, the, 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 the base business, if you like, on the pork side will, it will benefit from significant investment over the course of the next three to five years in particular. Poultry, I touched on before, is, will be a key feature of ours. As I said, we, we like the poultry sector. Uh, you'll see more development work in, in, in that, so watch this space on that front. Uh, and we acquired a pet food business uh, as of uh, January last year, uh, and we've heavily invested in that. We've signed a, a long-term commitment commitment with pets at home to deliver their uh, their their own product ranges uh, and that's our skill set d delivering uh, premium own label uh, products and we invest heavily on that so excited in those areas in particular so that's pretty much the, the entire facet of, of the business of course but uh, Ramona's is again uh, another key feature of ours and uh, the expansion into a new facility up near Manchester again will be another area that you'll see our continued growth in that space. Thank you very much I think that's a wrap. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Get in touch with us by email at shorterspodcasts at shorters.com or visit our website shorters.com forward slash investor download. So Cranswick, eh? that's yeah. a pretty good British business success story. Uh, Jean, as you said, you've known Adam for 10 years now. What were your key takeaways from today? Yeah, I've known him since uh, 2013, very much an income stock then, I think, and really not seen as necessarily a high growth category, you know, very pork focused. And so what really struck me was how the poultry business has grown now nearly 20% of the business. Um, and, you know, that didn't even exist when I first knew the company. And interestingly, they're still describing it as a high growth market. Um, and what could they do really now with the Mediterranean products um, with that side of the business? You know, and that's being recommended as a healthy diet by every NHS GP out there. Absolutely. And then the pet food angle as well. So clever how they're using some of the, the material that's not used in the, the human food business to, to look at pet food, which we know is a, a growing area of the market as well. Yeah, I mean, genius. Um, and then uh, I suppose secondly, what occurred to me was, you know, the real emphasis Adam put on people. Um, the whole, you know, during the whole conversation and, and the importance of that whole human capital angle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the statistics there on the, the longevity of the senior management team, Adam, as he spoke about, has been there for 30 years, Jim Brisby since 1995, Mark, the CFO since 2008, Chris, the COO since 1998. So I think that's really uh, speaks volumes for the business and the quality of the people there. Um, and it's also allowed the business to navigate some pretty difficult um, external environments. We've had the feed price inflation, various disease outbreaks and a pandemic as well. Uh, and the business really hasn't missed a beat. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, not to mention AI, with not, not the AI everyone's been talking about recently, but avian influenza exactly. also. So yeah, I mean, that speaks to a really strong people culture. Um, and then I suppose there was the operational grip that really comes through when you speak to Adam. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my investing takeaway is, as we said, food processing has been a bit of a graveyard for shareholders. It's a really difficult industry to make money in. Uh, there are lots of risks, not a lot of growth. Um, but Cranswick uh, being market leaders and really executing um, exemplary in an exemplary manner have delivered fantastic returns for shareholders. I think you can't say fairer than that. Excellent. Well, that was the show. We very much hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more, check out our website, schroders.com forward slash the investor download. You can also get in contact with us about anything in the show or ideas for future shows at Schroders podcast at schroders.com. Please remember to subscribe to us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to leave a review. We're now doing one show a week, which will be available every Thursday from 5pm UK time. Thanks very much for listening, but above all, keep safe and go well. Cheers. 
the value of investments and the income from them may go down as well as up, and investors may not get back the amounts originally invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The information is not an offer, solicitation or recommendation of any funds, services or products or to adopt any investment strategy.